Canada is, has also sort of recognized and has seen the impact of domestic violence making its way into the workplace. And over the last number of years, and as was uh, highlighted yesterday, some of the jurisdictions across Canada have taken steps within their occupational health and safety legislation to recognize uh, the obligations and the responsibilities of employers to uh, respond to situations where domestic violence can make its way into the workplace. And at the federal government and with the federally regulated uh, sector, that is happening now with Bill C-65, which is the act to amend the Canada Labour Code and the provisions related to harassment and violence. So this morning I am going to uh, share with you some of the key elements uh, of the bill and some of the regulations. So here we go. I don't think I need to sort of um, uh, dwell too much on the um, data. I think everybody in this room is very much aware of the uh, issue with regards to harassment and violence in the workplace and the impact. But I do want to draw your attention to the data at the bottom of the slide, which is the work that uh, Barb McCorry and, and Vicki Smallman really were leaders in here in Canada. Uh, and the two of them sort of, uh, it was a result of their work that we had the first national survey in 2013 that looked specifically at domestic violence in the workplace. And just to draw your attention on some of the key findings, of the respondents, 33.6 reported uh, that they had, had uh, experienced domestic violence. And of those 33.6, 53.5 indicated that the domestic violence had continued at work. 18.2% reported that the abuser physically came into the workplace. And 14.5 said the abuser contacted coworkers uh, and employees. So with that in mind, um, we sort of collectively within the government uh, of Canada recognized that we needed to look at harassment and violence and looked at strengthening uh, the provisions within the Canada Labour Code. And so our minister in 2015 was asked to take steps to address uh, workplace violence in the federally regulated work sector. And so we set about in 2016 and 17 to undertake consultations to inform uh, the drafting of Bill C-65, but we did that uh, under a broader framework. And so I just want to highlight some key elements of the framework for harassment and violence within the federal, uh, federally regulated sector. It's really built on three pillars, which is prevent, respond, and support. And it was quite striking to me yesterday listening to the presentations of uh, colleagues around the world that what struck me is this framework really m aligns with what we heard yesterday. The idea that if we prevent, if we put a focus on awareness to uh, f uh, foster sort of an acknowledgement and an appreciation of what it does harassment and violence look like and how might my actions be contributing to that? The emphasis on prevention, we're going to see uh, ultimately a decline in the instance of harassment and violence. But in the reality, unfortunately, it was we're never going to eliminate it completely, which then speaks to the response. And again, yesterday, as we listened to some of the presentations um, of what's happening globally, there was the recognition that in the event these types of occurrences um, happen in the workplace, we need an ability to respond appropriately. So similarly, uh, the response piece aligns nicely. And then finally, the support. So making available tools and resources for individuals that have been the object of the occurrence or, or even bystanders. Uh, the other piece I want to mention with regards to this support is uh, other changes that are happening within the Canada Labour Code and more specifically Part 3, which is the labour standards and apply to the private sector that is federally regulated. Uh, and just building on uh, what we heard last night uh, with regards to uh, leave for individuals that have experienced uh, family violence. Uh, sometime in May and June, the provisions as it relates to family violence are going to change. Uh, and at that time, there will be 10 days of uh, additional leave for individuals who they themselves have been the object of the violence or uh, their children. 
the 10 days of leave, five of which will be paid leave. So that is a significant change and a recognition um, and it speaks to the point that was raised yesterday is that those two, uh, those few weeks following a decision to leave a situation of domestic violence are very stressful. Uh, and knowing that there is an opportunity to um, take that step without losing um, employment is very critical. And we feel that this, uh, these changes to label standards will be very uh, welcomed. So let's move on to the, the Bill C-65 itself. Wrong way, sorry about that. So Bill C-65, uh, I really want to highlight what's going to be different and unique, and I'd like to start at sort of about 10 o'clock, uh, which is the concept of a single regime. So presently in the, the code, we deal with violence prevention in part two, which is occupational health and safety, and harassment provisions in part three, which is labor standard. Now, going forward with Bill C-65, we're talking about a single regime where we are going to be treating harassment and violence on a continuum. And a couple of reasons for this is, first of all, uh, we, we feel quite strongly that psychological injury should be treated in, uh, in the same way as physical injury. And so for that reason, the impact of harassment must be considered e equal to um, the, uh, the uh, injury that may occur if there has been physical physical violence. And so with that in mind, when the employer is made aware of an incident of harassment and violence, they need to respond in the same manner. And so the, the employer, when once made aware, they will follow some steps as outlined in the regulations, which include early resolution, where possible uh, conciliation or mediation. And if in the event early resolution and conciliation and me mediation is not effective, then we move on to an investigation. So whether the incident is an incident of harassment or violence, the single regime uh, will apply. So if we move uh, clockwise, uh, as I indicated, um, harassment and violence are going to be in a continuum, partly because, as I've already mentioned, because this injury, um, we do not want to su suggest that physical violence and the injuries that come out of physical environment, envi violence, excuse me, is more significant than psychological. So we're treating uh, psychological injury and illness equal to physical injury and illness. The other issue, and unfortunately we see this, is incidents of bullying and teasing will escalate, and or not will, may escalate to harassment and violence. So again, that concept of a continuum. As we move around the, the clock or the wheel, uh, a lot of emphasis is being paid to training. And again, we heard that uh, last night, the importance of training. It's training not just on sort of what are the, the rights and provisions in the, the code, but the training will also be focusing on what is um, harassment and violence. And most specifically for this uh, forum today, the uh, training as it relates to domestic violence. What are the signs uh, that a colleague may be in a situation of domestic violence, but also training with regards to what steps the employer will take when made aware that a situation of domestic violence could make its way into the workplace. Uh, moving around the clock, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, we've recognized is we don't actually have a lot of data as it relates to the incidence of harassment and violence uh, in the federally regulated workplace, in part because um, the obligations of the employers to make us aware of uh, incidents of harassment have not exist previously. So there will be increased reporting requirements uh, on the part of employers, which will help us to better understand um, the degree in which the, these types of incidents are, are occurring. We will be uh, obliged to sort of assess the efficacy and the impact of these legislative changes in five years' time. Uh, and we really, because I think collectively, we want to see a, a significant improvement in the workplace. And if our legislation or regulations have fallen short, we want an opportunity to recognize this and uh, modify the legislation and regulations sooner rather than later. Uh, we talked a little bit about the support, uh, and so there will be an obligation for employers to provide uh, some sort of support. 
but to qualify that a little bit to recognize that federally regulated sector includes uh, uh, small uh, businesses such as small trucking companies. It includes uh, tribal councils or band councils in First Nation communities. And so we, have, we would not be prescribing the type of support that needs to be provided to employer, but more broadly uh, asking employers to make their employees aware of the supports and services that are available to them. Uh, the final point I want to raise is that this new legislation for the very first time is going to apply to Parliament Hill. So uh, our members of Parliament and Senators will for the first time have these provisions applied to them. Uh, each member of Parliament will be treated as an individual employer and so uh, for obvious reasons they have a lot of, to think about as to how they're going to structure um, with regards to whether they're going to have policy committees, occupational health and safety representatives, how are they going to ensure that they're taking steps to be compliant as it relates to this legislation. So just moving on now to the regulations. So I'm sure many of you know the, sort of the legislation provides the overarching framework uh, for uh, the obligations of uh, employers. But m the regulations is really where uh, the detail is outlined. And I'm going to highlight some of the key elements of the, the regulations. First is timelines for the resolution process. When we went across the country to inform the drafting of Bill C-65, we heard from many people that when they made their employer aware of an inc incident, it was like a black hole. They never knew whether or not the employer was taking steps, um, whether the employer was taking their uh, notification uh, seriously. and so. Uh, in the new regulations, there will be timelines, timelines for which the employer needs to respond uh, to a notification so that there is an understanding on the part of the individual um, notifying the employer that steps are being taken. Uh, the other thing is uh, the time for which the resolution is resolved, or the occurrence is resolved, I'm sorry. Uh, we're putting timelines on that as well, because what we know, and I'm sure many of you in this room would be better appreciate that uh, than I would, is that when uh, an, a process is protracted, if an investigation or resolution takes one year and two years, it's very stressful for the parties involved. And so when we had our WebExes and had a number of subject matter experts and individuals supporting uh, employees who experienced workplace har harassment and violence, they consistently said, trying to resolve the situation as early as possible will ultimately uh, be uh, much more of a positive experience and have less of a psychological impact on the, on the parties. Uh, the other piece is um, with regards to recommendations. So what will happen in the event of an investigation, the investigator will come up with recommendations and there will be a timeline for which the employer must implement uh, the recommendations. With regards to the competent person, so this is the individual that would undertake an investigation in the workplace if the occurrence is not resolved through early resolution and mediation. Uh, some significant changes are, are going to be made as a result of Bill C-65. First of all, uh, the two workplace parties must agree on the individual. Uh, secondly, we are changing the requirements of the qualifications to include um, the requirement to have a knowledge of the Canadian Human Rights Act. And the reason is that if we look at populations most at risk, they are groups that are um, also recognized as groups that are more likely to experience discrimination in Canada, uh, whether it's visible minorities, uh, the LGBTQ2 community, Indigenous uh, Canadians. And so uh, our feedback that we had through the consultation is that whoever is investigating must also have some knowledge and understanding of the Canadian Human Rights Act and the uh, prohibited grounds set out in that act. With regards to the harassment and violence uh, prevention policy, and it was very interesting listening to the presentations uh, last night and that whole concept of, of social contract. Uh, I see the European Union in some ways advanced, uh, more advanced in, than North America in this regard. Uh, the concept of the workplace parties really working together. 
uh, to uh, address issues such as uh, workplace harassment and, and violence. And so given the successes we've seen in Europe, we've put some emphasis in the regulations with regards to co-development. So for the employers and the employee representatives to really work together to uh, de co-develop uh, the policy as it relates to harassment and violence prevention, either identify and uh, uh, develop the, the training. The other piece that we learned from Europe is that uh, what we've come to realize is training needs to be sector specific. It can't be generic, it can't um, be broad. And so the training that might be relevant for uh, employees in the banking sector is not relevant for employees in the trucking sector. And so again, uh, the, the some of the research and work that's come out of Europe has really highlighted and showcased that. Uh, and we've sort of emphasized that uh, as well in the regular excuse me, in the regulations. So then I want to get to the uh, final point, uh, which was in regards to former employees and family violence. Uh, the members of Parliament uh, felt quite strongly that former employees needed to have some of the same um, protections as if they were still in the workplace. And so uh, the bill was changed as a result of um, amendments put forward by the members of Parliament. So an employee within the first three months of leading, leaving the workplace would, will still have the same provisions and, um, and um, uh, securities as they might if they were still in the workplace. So what I mean by that is if they've left the workplace and they've, you know, realized that really they had experienced workplace harassment and violence, they can notify the employer within three months of leaving the workplace and the employer will have the same obligation to respond as though they were still within the workplace. That three months will can be extended at the discretion uh, of our minister for uh, uh, a variety of reasons and examples that we um, highlighted through our consultation process might be that the individual's um, psychological health and or physical health um, ha was such they weren't in a position to come forward um, to, and inform their employer within those first three months. So that period of time, as I say, can be extended. The other piece I do want to touch on is the whole issue of uh, family violence or domestic violence. Uh, when we started the consultations in um, in April, and so we did a series of roundtables across the country, we uh, started here in Toronto, and we talked about the um, need for employers to respond when made aware that domestic violence could make in the, their way into the workplace. And at that first round table, we didn't really have any sort of um, concrete ideas of what that might look like from the perspective of the employer. So the employer, uh, again, and I think we heard a little bit of this last night, um, we're signaling we don't want to take on a societal issue. And we were saying what we're talking about is when you're made aware that a situation of domestic violence could come into the workplace in, and impact the, the safety of not only the party involved but others in the workplace that there is an obligation there. And so we had a similar type of conversation in Montreal and I thought, okay, well, we should really give Barb and, and Vicky a call and that was very uh, valuable. Because as a result of that call, Barb and Vicky were able to give us some concrete um, ideas of what the employer could do. Uh, and so in our subsequent roundtables across the country, we were able to give examples that the employers recognized were appropriate. And in some of them we saw yesterday um, and in some of the work around the ILO convention, which is identifying individuals in your organization who have additional training and are equipped to respond appropriately when made aware that an employee is in a situation of domestic violence. To look and include training around domestic violence in some of the broader harassment and violence training. And again, uh, both those um, activities will help to address the stigma that is associated with domestic violence. If we think about uh, why people aren't coming forward and informing their employer that there is a risk that domestic violence is uh, going to make its way in the workplace, it's because of the stigma. So if there are steps we can take to address the stigma, then employers will be made aware and they are then in a position to take the necessary steps to ensure the health and safety of all uh, in the workplace. 
Uh, the idea of, uh, when made aware, that there be some sort of workplace assessment, and that is not sort of um, the typical workplace assessment. You need to look to individuals, and, and I think there are a number of you here in the room who have expertise of looking at the workplace from the perspective of the risk of domestic violence making its way uh, into the workplace. And so, uh, and another um, piece of um, concrete steps is some form of accommodation, whether that's the change of work hours, making available uh, an unlisted uh, phone number or email address. So think about how um, the uh, domestic violence can make its way in the uh, workplace. It's not just uh, physical presence, but other uh, activities as well. Uh, and so, as I say, once we sort of ha were able to give some concrete uh, ideas, as we had the conversations uh, across the country and then through our second and third wave of the consultations, there was a recognition there is a role and that working together, employers and, and employee representatives and subject matter experts like many of you in the room, uh, we can sort of look to uh, define more clearly what that is going to look like. And so uh, I'm really excited of, of, uh, for the rest of the day and, and what we're going to uh, take away uh, from the discussion. So thank you very much.